So welcome everyone. Um, this is a meeting on the Irish referendum um, hosted by NYC for Abortion Rights. Um, my name is Emily Brooks um, and we have some great panelists with us today. Um, and so as folks probably know, on May 25th, people in the Republic of Ireland voted overwhelmingly uh, to repeal the Eighth Amendment, which prohibited abortion. <laughs> So this is a fantastic victory, um, and here to talk about it a little bit, we have Becca Bohr, who is Skyping in uh, from Northern Ireland. Becca, can you hear? No. Okay. Well, she's <laughs> can you hear me? There. Okay. Um, Becca has been organizing with uh, People Before Profit, um, and she was involved in the repeal campaign. Um, we also have Roisin Davis. Um, who's a literary agent and book editor here in New York City, um, and who is from Northern Ireland originally. Um, and we have Sarah Jaffe, a journalist, um, author of Necessary Trouble, Americans in Revolt, who was reporting on the campaign in Ireland recently. Um, and so we're just going to get into it. Um, we're going to be talking about um, some of the history that preceded this campaign, some of the on-the-ground organizing, um, and also what's next in the North where abortion is still illegal, and what are lessons for us here in the United States and in other places, which, what can we take away from this and learn. Um, so if Becca can hear, we will start with Becca. So I can't hear a word anyone saying, but if you can hear me, put your thumb up, Emily. Can you hear me? All right, happy days. So I'll just carry on and <laughs> talk until you don't want me to talk anymore. So um, hopefully I'll be able to hear you at some point. Thank you so much for having me. It's been um, absolutely incredible this past um, really two months here, uh, six weeks intensively um, on the abortion referendum here. And it's been an absolute tremendous victory that we are so, so um, obviously happy about, but also overjoyed. And I think that um, the amount of excitement and the way in which this campaign really captured the excitement, the hope, the jubilation of layers and layers of people, um, women who sort of found their feet, their voices, their strength through this campaign cannot be um, underestimated. And hopefully um, Rashin and um, Sarah will talk a bit to that as well. But I think what we saw was an unbelievably incredible grassroots campaign that really was, um, it was grassroots, it stretched from, you know, southernmost point of Ireland all the way through the north. It was a movement that was um, young, it was vibrant, it was creative, it was artistic, it was fun. Um, but it was also a movement of people that linked together, that had been fighting for some time, really, um, ever since, you know, there's been scandal after scandal from the Catholic Church. There's been uh, a variety of, um, of, of cases that you might be familiar with, the X case in 92, um, obviously the, the death of Savita um, Hapa. Halapanavar, sorry, that was embarrassing, um, who really loads of people came out onto the streets. Tens of thousands of people came out to say enough is enough. And these networks of people have been growing um, and working together for, for, for a long time. And I think that really came out in this campaign because it was intergenerational. There were people learning from each other. And then there were loads of people where this was really the first campaign they've ever been a part of um, and we're so excited to be knocking on doors and going to protests and going to events and things like that and it was really um, a real sense of confidence has grown out of this campaign that I think one can't be underestimated and two hopefully won't go away anytime anytime soon I think there's a few really important things to take from it first of all I think nobody Really nobody anticipated the landslide victory that we saw. It was absolutely incredible. I mean, the night that we heard the exit polls, I was in the pub with a bunch of my friends who we had all been out campaigning. We had all been out um, 
door knocking and we sort of broke into bread and roses and singing songs and didn't know what to do with ourselves. We were so over the moon and so excited because of um, um, a victory. But I also think what it showed, and if you look at some of the exit polls, I think there's some lessons from it. One is that people's voices and the voices of women were unbelievably important to, um, to how people ended up voting. And I think that when we took away this idea that we can talk about abortion as this sort of abstract, moral, philosophical, medical, or um, religious issue, and actually talked about real women or real people who are pregnant and their real decisions um, and real cases, that that really uh, came out. And so I think one of the things that actually won the referendum was a, a Facebook page called In Her Shoes, uh, Women of the Eighth, that women, woman after woman or person who's pregnant after person who's pregnant talked about their experience um, and why they made the choice, why they made that trip to England, why they took an abortion pill, why they were sort of shrouded in shame and stigma, and why this was the right decision for them. And I think people saw the diversity of reasons, um, but also saw the humanity. And I think at the end of the day, people um, began to really, you know, more and more people began to see women as women, as humans, as, as real um, people who are making decisions the best that they could um, for, for their lives. And so I think choice began to be the most important issue of the of the debate or the most important way in which the debate was framed. Um, and that was certainly true with, if you looked at exit polls. So it wasn't so much um, arguments around religion or morality or things like that, but it was actually how um, people said, well, I actually, at the end of the day, I might not have an abortion myself, but I, but I trust um, or I think that a woman should have a choice over her own body. And I think for so many women, that was unbelievably important. So when people were watching the tallies come in um, and the results in, in Dublin Castle, when people were celebrating and crying, it was unbelievably emotional. And some of the commentators have been, you know, immediately were like, what are they doing? These are abortionists celebrating abortion. What's wrong with them? You know, this is nothing to celebrate. People should be much more, you know, solemn or whatever. Um, and I do think that there was a real sense where a layer of women felt like they were being treated as a human, a full human with a choice to be respected by others for the first time in a, it, maybe, maybe ever in terms of how, how the state recognizes them. And that was something that was uh, reiterated to, to those of us who are either young or those of us who are new to activism or those of us who are new to Ireland by loads of people who had been involved in this campaign for some time. And I think that that was um, really important to, to, to see sort of that, that, um, that, that change for people in terms of how they view themselves in Ireland and how they view other Irish people vis-a-vis -vis how they view them, you know, as, as real, real, real humans. I think that in the last, you know, week or two of the campaign, we began to see the flailing of the right um, and sort of the scary, the scary way in which the, the right wing uh, operates. You know, obviously in the United States, we're no, uh, uh, you know, we're not surprised when the right wing and the anti-choicers do something obscene, like, for example, take their car and almost ran onto the sidewalk of, you know, yes, um, canvassers. That, I mean, obviously it's horrible, and we wouldn't want to see that in the United States, but I think there's a viciousness to the far right of anti-choicers in the United States that was kind of new to some folks in Ireland. Um, and so I think in the last week and a half, we saw some of the, the real angry bitterness, all these Americans who had come over to Ireland um, in order to, to back the no campaign, really playing, playing nasty. And I think that actually strengthened the yes side in a real serious way. I think people began to say, no, basically say this isn't on, and it really backfired for them, which I think is really, uh, really important um, as well. I think the, that feeling of jubilation and this feeling of we're in a new Ireland is still very much how people feel. So we're only two weeks after. So obviously, like, there was the jubilation of the first week, you know, the, the partying, the singing songs, the, all of that. And then there was the, 
beginning to let sort of the, the reality of, of the referendum, the hard work, begin, begin to sink in. But I think that there's a huge amount of, of momentum that still exists and can really be harnessed for, um, for, for, for the continued fight. Um, and so there's two, I think, major continued fights. One is around the north. So I live in Derry, and in uh, Northern Ireland, abortion is still illegal um, in, all, in all cases, except if the life of the mother is um, at risk. And the second is for a whole slew of questions that really got opened through the abortion referendum. So one of those would be you know, the separation of church and state. That is a big conversation that has been happening over the past five years. I think it's intensified, but these last two months, I think they've, it's really intensified, particularly getting the Catholic Church out of the education and health system. And so the hospitals, many of them are, you know, sister of whomever's um, hospital. 95% um, of the primary schools are run by the Catholic Church. And so there's a real sense that there's um, space and, and time for something, something new. But I guess what I wanted to focus the second part of what I wanted to say today is about the North, because this was very much an all-Ireland referendum, even though the referendum was only uh, like legally um, in the South. So we had um, literally hundreds of canvassers and campaigners come from the North, if not more, down to, to the South to help out, to door knock, to, to join in in protests and in stalls and go to meetings and hand out leaflets and do all of that. And in fact, many the folks in the North sponsored some of the people who in the South who are abroad who wanted to come home, um, sponsored their trips home, sponsored their ability to vote. Um, and we felt very much like this victory was not just a victory for our sisters down south, but also a victory for all of us because of the way in which it can transform society so quickly. And so the last night of the, of the referendum, we had been um, based in Derry, and the south is literally a five-minute drive. Um, and so we had been canvassing uh, pretty regularly about four times, five times a week um, over the border um, in different border towns and, and linking up with um, all these different pockets of, of folks. And we really became like, it felt like a big family um, of canvassers. And so the, the last night before the, um, before the vote, a whole crew of folks from Inishon, which is the, uh, the most northerly peninsula in Ireland, went up to the most northerly point, Mullen Head, in order to watch the sun set on the Eighth Amendment. Um, and so there are probably about 40 or 50 of us who all got up there together um, to, to watch the sun set and to sort of take stock of what we've done over the past two, two months. We all became quite close. Um, you know, literally hundreds of WhatsApp messages a day of, of organizing and, and all of that. Um, and so as we were watching the sunset um, on the Eighth Amendment, those of us who came, came up from the North were really feeling like, oh, you know, we're so excited, but this, there was a tinge of sadness, you know, that, that, that you know, whatever was going to happen that next day was not going to um, provide abortion for us um, in the North. And the, the, the folks there knew exactly what we were feeling and just looked over to, you know, to, to our sort of group and said, you know, we're coming up north next. Don't you worry. The north is next. We'll be there. And in, in, in uh, Dublin Castle the next day, the ch chance of the north is next really took hold and people had signs and there was this real sense of we're going up north. And that really has been true. And so there's a huge amount of momentum um, that hasn't slowed down. So since the referendum, which again was two weeks ago, we've had three protests in the north. Um, one that was called immediately after in Belfast that had maybe about 500 vote people at it, which was a great um, uh, sort of a immediate um, protest. And then there's been nonstop in the media conversations about abortion. What does this mean for the north? Uh, how do we get abortion um, access and uh, abortion reform. There was a protest yesterday as part of a, a commemoration of 100 years since some women had got the right to vote um, in, in 1918. There's a big commemoration here, and the ranks in, in Belfast swelled to about um, 
some people say around 5,000 people, and the huge proportion of that was a pro-choice contingent of people coming, people from Together for Yes coming from the South, coming from Donegal, coming from, from Dublin, coming up from as far south as, as uh, Wexford, all up to say, we know that the North is next. And so the, the reality for, for the North is a little bit complicated. Um, I'm sure Rocky can answer any questions of, about the, the status of the North. But um, right now we don't have a government, as folks might know. Um, and abortion is a devolved issue, so it's a Northern Ireland issue. Um, it's not considered a Westminster issue. Um, and so we haven't had a government for the last eight, 17 months. And so the DUP, who right now is propping up the Tories in sort of their um, uh, reaction, reactionary way, is steadfast against abortion. Now, it's not just the DUP who's against abortion. Every major party... Um, in the Northern Ireland Assembly is an anti-choice party, although they're beginning to stick their fingers in the air and realize that um, that's no longer the popular stance. And so people are, some of the parties are changing their positions. So this weekend is actually Sinn Féin's Ardash, um, which is their, like, um, uh, their national conference, and hopefully they will vote to become a pro-choice party, which would be very, very exciting. Um, Sinn Féin supported the referendum in the South, but their position is to the right of what the government is actually putting forward. The government's putting forward um, abortion um, up to for up to 12 weeks um, upon request, and that's Sinn Féin's position is only in the cases of rape, uh, incest, or fatal fetal abnormality. Hopefully, there's lots of Sinn Féin activists who are pro-choice. Hopefully, that will pass um, this week, and they, they will change their party's position. Um, but aside from that, the SCLP, the Social Democratic Labor Party, and the UUP, the Ulster Unionist Party, as well as the um, Alliance Party, those parties are um, abortion's a conscience issue, so it's a free vote for all their members. They don't have a party stance on it. Um, and then the DUP is anti-abortion anti or anti-choice anti in, in every case, um, including um, uh, rape and incest and fatal fetal abnormality. So that's the state in, in the Northern Ireland Assembly right now, but there's nothing's happening in the Assembly because they haven't decided to, to be in the Assembly for 18 months. So th this is why people are looking to Westminster. And obviously, Theresa May doesn't want to mess up her relationship with the DUP because she needs the DUP's votes in the upcoming Brexit um, debates, which is all happening in the next week and a half. There's going to be a tremendous amount of decisions that are made, and the Tories are barely holding that together um, to the glee of many. However, um, they do need the, the DUP to get over the line for those votes. And so that's why this past week and a half has been very interesting if you've been watching Westminster. And so there have been two, two sort of main things that have happened this week. One is a uh, Labour MP, Stella Creasy, has put forward um, a, a debate last week and then is hoping to put forward a bill that decriminalizes abortion in England, it, um, England, Scotland, and Wales. So the 1967 Act, I'm sorry if this is a little bit um, detail-oriented, but the 1967 Act, which, which allows abortion in some cases in England, Scotland, and Wales, which was never um, brought over to Northern Ireland, that Act gives exceptions over um, the original law that criminalizes abortion. And so what this MP, which is a labor MP, is putting forward is she wants to remove the two clauses in the original law, which was from 1861, that criminalize abortion. And so if she's able to get votes on that, then that means that in the whole of the UK, including Northern Ireland, abortion would no longer be criminalized. And so that then would force, one would think, the Assembly in Northern Ireland to get back up and running in order for them to vote to recriminalize abortion. And so that's what the, the debate is right now um, in Westminster. Um, May has been, Theresa May has been holding out, try, trying to say, no, she doesn't want this debate to happen in Westminster, but there's too much pressure right now, and it will happen, which is quite exciting. 
Also, just on Thursday, the Supreme Court just um, came down with a decision that said that the Northern Ireland abortion policy is incompatible with the European Convention of Human Rights, particularly on the cases of rape, incest, and fatal fetal abnormality. So the Supreme Court here has said that Northern Ireland cannot continue um, with the status quo. Um, they had to, th they then determined to throw out that case on a technicality, but the actual decision is the most progressive decision that a Supreme Court has taken here um, uh, in the UK. So all signs look good for there to be um, some kind of uh, drastic abortion reform um, here in the North. Whether it stops at being um, for, in cases of rape, incest, and fetal, fetal abnormality, or if Stella Creasy's bill goes through and decriminalizes abortion across the UK and Northern Ireland, and then something else is put in, um, is, is still to be determined. Well, the thing that we're doing here is we are linking up with our um, sisters and all the campaigners um, across Ireland who have been fighting for this um, momentous referendum and trying to keep all the pressure up, saying, we're not going to wait. We're not going to wait until you know, Theresa May decides it's a, it's a safe time for her to, you know, talk about abortion reform. We're not going to wait until an assembly is up because we'll be waiting forever. And we're not going to wait until United Ireland, um, which is what some other uh, political parties are, are pushing for. But we're going to say that we want abortion rights now, we want the right to choose, and we want it to be free, safe, and legal. And so that's the key thing both in the North, where we have the NHS, where if abortion was decriminalized, it would be free, safe, and legal, whereas in the South, there's now a continued fight to make free, safe, and legal a reality. So, thank you. Thanks, Becca. I don't think she can hear me, but <laughs> that was great. Um, so now we'll hear from Roisin, right? Yes. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I just want to begin by sort of touching on Becca's point of the sort of power and centrality of sort of people's voices in, in the campaign, um, which is what really helped to create such a momentous victory. Um, and I'm, so I'm going to begin by reading a letter um, which was written by my, a friend of mine who's here tonight, um, and it was written by um, her uh, stepmother, who's a GP in uh, Sligo, which is on the west coast of Ireland. <laughs> And this was written just to the, the, one of the local papers in Sligo. But I think I, I just wanted to start off reading because I think it sort of conveys a sense of the historical context in Ireland that we've been facing. Um, dear editor, my parents were born in 1920 in Galway. My mother gave birth to 14 children. She died suddenly when I was six years old. The youngest of the family was 16 months. We were lucky the cruelty officer did not come to our home and place us in an orphanage. The same good fortune did not apply to my mother's siblings. Four of her sisters and two of her brothers were placed in orphanages in Galway because their mother had died young also. They committed no crime. They were poor and technically orphans. Fathers at that time were deemed incapable of raising children alone. My mother's siblings grew up in a cruel, cold Catholic institution that shamed them to their core. They carried this shame to their graves. The deafening silence that existed for decades about their treatment echoes the shameful silence imposed on women who have been forced to travel to the UK for a termination. My first cousin, Margaret Mary O'Connor, was born in the tomb mother and baby home. She died in that awful place at six months old. Her mother, Maggie, who had been raised in St. Anne's Orphanage, Galway, was sent after the birth to a laundry in Ballinasloe to pay off her debt for the so-called care that she had received in the mother and baby home. It is still unknown if her body lies along with hundreds of other babies in the tomb septic tank or if she was exchanged for money and adopted abroad. The pain of my family of origin has seeped into my soul and has altered how I look at the world. This country has never been safe for women, particularly poor women. It degrades, neglects, mistreats, and demoralizes us. The clerical, political, medical, and educational establishment created a toxic culture that kept women in a subservient position for decades. 
They have excelled in brainwashing and molding a submissive, obedient culture. This culture has ensured that we have created a society lacking in empathy for ourselves and each other. It has harassed and abused young women for generations. They have drenched our DNA in shame. For years, it has been a crime to conceive out of wedlock. Control has always been exercised to keep vulnerable and powerless women in their place. Few spoke up to defend them. The Eighth Amendment criminalizes women who take abortion pills in Ireland. The reality is that thousands travel to the UK for termination every year. It is utter hypocrisy to compel women to travel to the UK for a termination and deem this an acceptable solution. Um, my job as a doctor is to listen and heal and give hope. I do not stand in another woman's shoes. I do not know her story. I have not lived her life. I have not been through her pain. I have no right to condemn or judge any woman who chooses a termination if that is her decision. My hope is for women, all women, to live in a country where they are respected. Having control over one's body is of paramount importance in establishing that respect. So I think, as you know, I, I, I think um, essentially, you know, women, what that letter conveys and, and you know, the, the, the historical, the context that we've been facing as um, Irish women is that, you know, women have essentially been subject to a sort of totalitarian regime in Ireland um, and treated as second-class citizens in the law and merely as kind of vessels. Um, and that's been, you know, since the creation of the Irish state um, in, in the 1920s, I mean, Ireland has simply exported the problem of abortion to, to England. Um, and just to kind of go over what the, the current law is that um, any woman who has an abortion in Ireland faces up to 14 years in prison. Um, it's one of the most restrictive regimes in the world. Um, the only case in which a woman is legally allowed to terminate the pregnancy is when her life is deemed to be in immediate danger of death. Um, and it's not allowed in cases of fatal, fetal abnormality, rape, or incest. Um, essentially, if a woman if a woman is raped in Ireland and has an abortion, she can face more time in jail than her rapist. Um, so, I, as Becca had mentioned, I mean, abortion was sort of established in um, the mid-19th century under the Offences of the Person Act, but it was the inclusion in 1983 after um, the referendum um, of the 12th Amendment that sort of enshrined this into law. And what that did was um, gave equal, um, uh, basically an equal right to life to the mother and the fetus. Um, and so, you know, what you had in the 1980s, I think, which kind of led up to that was, um, uh, you know, there was this, um, the f there were three governments, I think, in the, in the space of uh, something like uh, 18 months. Um, and the um, government, the government was was kind of lobbied by the pro-life amendment campaign, which is you know composed of members of the you know Catholic clergy and the rest of it. And there's just been this kind of horrible um, forces of reaction, um, you know, really mainly to do with the Catholic Church. I mean, the Catholic, you know, Ireland does not have. Um, you know, it, around the kind of creation of the state and the revolution, um, you know, I mean, Ireland actually has a very kind of proud uh, legacy of, of, of radicalism and feminism. However, um, you know, and, and these kind of, you know, women's rights were sort of um, promised in the, in the proclamation. However, you know, what you had was essentially kind of women being um, written out of, of, of history. And in the mid kind of 1930s, under Eamon de Valera, who was um, in power for, <laughs> who was in power for um, around sort of 50 years, um, you know, you had this kind of exceptionally socially conservative um, state where the Catholic Church was sort of the, became the ideological wing of, of the state. And in the in the constitu constitution in, in 1937, I mean, it essentially. Um, enshrined uh, a woman's place as being in the home. It meant women couldn't serve on juries. It meant that women um, had to leave their job as soon as they got married. I mean, it's just exceptionally sexist and archaic. And actually, there's going to be a referendum soon, which is hoping to um, repeal the amendment that says a woman's place is fundamentally in the home. Um, 
So, <laughs> which in is the great, Constitution, yeah. y'all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so you had things kind of turn around, really, in the in the nineties with the X case, and that was when um, a fourteen-year-old girl um, who was suicidal because she'd been raped um, went to seek an abortion in 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 Britain, and um, her. Her parents had informed the, the Gardaí, which are the, the, the Irish police, that she was going to do this because they wanted to kind of open an investigation. And she was basically prevented by um, a high court injunction to go to Britain to, to, to have the abortion. And, um, you know, I think uh, le legitimately, you know, this really kind of horrified um, Irish society, this, this horrible, inhumane uh, treatment. And um, after that, there was an appeal, and in which it was um, then there was a, in which she was allowed to go to Britain to seek the abortion. Um, and then after that, there was a kind of um, referendum, which then um, allowed uh, women to go abroad to seek the abortion. Of course, that's been happening, but you know, kind of legally. But of course, that's been happening for years. Um, you know, I, I, as a child, lived in London, and. Um, my mother was part of a, a, a group of um, feminist um, activists in London who, it was a kind of a support network, so women would come over to have abortions and they would need a place to spend a couple of nights um, while they were doing so. And, you know, this has always just been such a, an open secret, you know? Um, and, you know, so, so we would have women in our house constantly when, when I was younger who would come over, you know, kind of no questions asked, no names asked, just to, to protect them. Um, you know, um, but, you know, but essentially after that case in the 90s, the government failed to even legislate on that. You had basically kind of 20 years of inaction. Um, and then things really kind of reached a turning point in 2012 with the death of, as Becca had mentioned, with the death of Savita. Um, because, so, so what happened uh, with Savita was she was a 31-year-old dentist um, from India, originally living in Galway. And she'd been rushed to the hospital because she had septicemia. She was, she was dying um, and she needed an abortion to, to save her life. And the doctors, uh, refused, they cited the Eighth Amendment and they refused to perform it and they told her that this is a Catholic country, we can't do this. And uh, as her mother would say, as her mother said, it was in an attempt to save a four month old fetus, they killed my 30, 30 year old daughter. Um, and I think, you know, this, that mo moment, um, because, you know, it, it, it just sort of, I think it just made people sort of think, you know, what kind of a society are are we living in that this, you know, that this happens? Um, and it really, it really galvanized, um, it really galvanized Ireland. It, it really kind of, uh, you know, brought the issue um, to, to the fore kind of once again, that we can't let this happen again, you know, really, never again really has been the kind of rallying slogan around, around Savita. Um, and then another, I mean, a, sort of an important um, uh, aspect too was in, in 2016, there was um, something called the Citizens' Assembly where the, um, the government decided to kind of consult, sort of as a, a consulting the public on policy issues. Um, and they chose 99 people at random and, you know, to sort of survey them about what, um, what, hap what, needs to, what kind of changes need to take place in policy, et cetera. And um, the those people uh, it included w uh, people from women's rights groups and they made um, kind of a bunch of recommendations that essentially led to the, 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 the kind of the basis for the, ref the proposed referendum and the proposed reform. Um, that's another, you know, that's kind of been another um, important thing. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when you, you, when you kind of, you know, when you do look at this and, and again, going back to, Going there, you know, going back to the the issue of just the kind of importance that the Catholic Church, the sway that the Catholic Church, this kind of so-called morality that was imposed, um, you know, it's just that that the, that importance can't really be understated. You know, what you what you had was it was a society in which women's women were incarcerated and criminalized. Um, and you know that can be seen, especially in the case of these of these mother and baby homes, of these Magdalene laundries, which were these 
awful institutions um, where, you know, 10,000 women um, between the formation of the state in 1922 um, and 1996, which is what's awful, is the last one of these places closed in 1996. Um, so these were these kind of uh, workhouses where, you know, I'm sure people are, are aware of, of them, but um, there were these workhouses where, where kind of um, women, unmarried mothers were sent in order to sort of hide them from society. Um, and they were forced to perform uh, manual labor. That's what they, they were laundries. The state um, funded them essentially as, you know, because they, they were able to um, do this business of, of, um, of, as laundries. And I mean, they were just the most kind of barbaric institutions. I mean, they were condemned by the UN um, saying that girls placed in these institutions were forced to work in slavery-like conditions and were often subject to inhuman, cruel, and degrading treatment as well as physical and sexual abuse. Um, people were in these places were deprived of their identity. Um, you know, they were made to shave their heads. They, they, weren't, al uh, they, didn't, they weren't allowed to use their, their real names. I mean, it was just, you know, this kind of barbaric um, treatment of, of, of women um, has, has just really kind of failed to, uh, you know, look after women in the most basic way. And it's, you know, as a public health issue and, and everything else. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, um, you know, essentially, I think what's, what's, what's changed you know, I mean, because the the the, the Eighth Amendment was inserted in the, in 1983, and that was a very it was a very similar actually proportion. It was 67 percent that voted for that. But I think what you have these days is you have a very very different society in Ireland. You have the youngest population in Europe, um, you know, and the young young people um, sort of really, you know, kind of were, were absolutely the most instrumental um, aspect of, of, of winning this referendum. Um, I mean, I think it was something like 94% of, you know, young women between 18 and 24, uh, there was a, sorry, 94% um, uh, increase in people, in women uh, between 18 and 24 registering to vote. Um, you know, I think that it's amongst younger people, a kind of a, a generation, the sort of generation, I suppose, of, of, of people sort of that, you know, witnessing things like Savita uh, case going on and saying, you know, this is, this is not the country that we want. We need change. And that's why this has just been so, you know, that's why it's been, been a landslide. It's why it's um, been so successful. Um, and there's been amazing organizing going on and I do think that the kind of you know the the heroic really effort in a in a in a, in a society in which you know you, you weren't ever allowed you know allowed to mention the word abortion um, in which you know sex education is mitigated by Catholic schools in so therefore you know um, and you know I, I think just kind of breaking that silence, has been so important, and you know, it's and it's not only been a case of break, of kind of breaking that silence, but it's been incredibly kind of vociferous and incredibly impressive. And yes, I just hope the North is next. So. <laughs> set my timer so I don't talk too much. <clears throat> um, hi. I'm not Irish. Um, I wish green. I was. I'm wearing green. <laughs> Actually, what I wanted, because um, Roisin mentioned this sort of wonderful history of like radical women in Ireland, I have to show off this tote bag which I brought back from my trip while I was covering it. And this is this line from Constance Markovitz, who is one of the famous revolutionaries in 1916, um, about dress suitably in short skirts and strong boots and put your jewels and gold wands in the back. I mean, she was a little fancy, but, <laughs> and buy a revolver, which is a little weird of the thing to be carrying around the United States right now, but I still love it. <laughs> um, and I want to bring that up because like, I fell in love with Ireland back in 2001, the first time I went to that country, and I was like, I'd move here if they had legal abortion. Um, so now that I'm like almost too old to worry about it, they're gonna have legal abortion, it's great. Um, but 
I, and one of the things that I was really, that I fell in love with was this history and these women, these incredible women who fought for their country's freedom in every garrison in the 1916 Rising except the one under Eamon de Valera because he sucks. Um, and if the British had just shot him in 1916, we'd be all be better off. But anyway, I digress. Only a little. Um, because I do want to go back to the fact that the Eighth Amendment doesn't just ban abortion. It, is, it gives the fetus equal rights to the person it is gestating within. Um, and they're trying to do that to us all the time in the US, right? Mississippi had a big fight over this just a few years ago. Um, this is their ultimate goal, because the thing is that it doesn't just ban abortion. It doesn't just hurt people who are trying to have an abortion, even if, like Savita, they wanted desperately to have this pregnancy and it went colossally wrong, which it often does, because death and childbirth is still one of the major killers of women of a certain age, particularly in this country, we should say black women of a certain age. Um, it also affects people who are, their pregnancy is fine. I spoke with a friend of mine who's a lawyer there who had represented a woman who the doctors decided that she should have a C-section. And she said no. And so they took her to court. And there was a court appointed lawyer for her fetus while they debated whether this woman should be chased down by the cops if she left the hospital, forced to be basically held down and have a surgery against her will. Um, they won that case, but it was citing the Eighth Amendment. And so this has had major effects on women's health care, not just when they're seeking abortion. Um, and so overturning it is a huge change in how people are going to be treated, hopefully if we can get the Catholic Church out of the hospitals, um, in the hospital. And that is the other question, is where and how this infrastructure for abortion care is going to be built. We will see that, I'm sure, over the next however long. It gives me an excellent excuse to go back and visit. Um, so I spent a week in Ireland right up until the referendum, um, including a few days in uh, Derry with Becca, going canvassing with them in Donegal, which was wonderful. Wonderful. Um, and I went up there because Donegal was the place that had voted in the highest percentages for the Eighth Amendment in 1983. Um, and then, so I didn't want to just stay in Dublin where, you know, 70 something percent of Dublin voted yes. Um, but, you know, in fact, actually 67% of the entire country voted yes. So it was not actually as disproportionate as we thought. Um, and then I ended up going out on a bus with folks on the day before the vote out to Roscommon, Leitrim, and Longford, um, which were also places that had voted no on the marriage equality referendum in 2015, to sort of go out to the places and, and meet the rural campaigners, see what was happening in places where everybody was not wearing these excellent repeal jumpers that this person over here is wearing that are beautiful. Um, and where people are afraid to talk to you and where canvassers told me stories of like, we don't send two canvassers down the same street because you don't wanna knock on two doors side by side because people won't talk to you if their neighbor sees them talking to you. So you have to be very careful. They told stories of like trying to hand somebody a flyer and the person would push it back at them but squeeze their hand underneath it to let them know. Um, they spent a lot of time thinking about how to put things on social media because again, people didn't want to talk to you in public, but it would mean a lot to them if they could see that there were people in their neighborhood who were voting yes. Um, this kind of thing, the way that like the, the you know, people would still drive by in the car and shout at you that you should be ashamed of yourself. And one, um, one day when I was out with folks in Donegal, this woman sort of yelled at the canvasser on her doorstep and then came out and sort of followed them around the neighborhood. Um, and like not in a terribly, she was not terribly threatening, but just kind of stalking around with a very sour look on her face. Um, and it, it would be like, you're disgusting, you should be ashamed of yourself a lot. Um, and people really, as Becca was saying, right up before the vote had just horrible stories of being, um, chased around their neighborhoods, called baby killers, um, all of these things. Um, so but the last time I was in Ireland before this, I had actually been in 2016 for the anniversary of the Easter Rising and the sort of 100th anniversary celebrations and all of this, and met folks even then who are working on uh, the trade union campaign to repeal the 8th, which if anybody like me spends a lot of time around the US labor movement, you are perhaps shocked that this is a thing that this was a very big thing, that they actually put money into a research project called <laughs> Abortion is a Workplace Issue. <laughs> Shocking, I know. Um, 
but that these are campaigns that had been going for years, right? That the, you know, the referendum was actually called and they sort of only announced the actual date of the vote like two months before it was going to be called. But there was all of this buildup and there were these campaigns within things like the trade union movement to really discuss this, to think about how it affects people at work, um, to think about how perhaps it is the duty of the labor movement to represent people in more than just things that take place on the shop floor, just a thought. Um, and so you had a campaign that was sort of both years long and also came together very, very quickly and crossed a lot of political lines to bring together the sort of Together for Yes campaign. Um, and it came together in an incredible way where, again, people were completely shocked by the exit poll result. I was out with uh, a couple of folks and this one guy was just like, have you ever heard of a poll being off by that much? <laughs> Hey, it can't be like 18 points off, right? What's the like, you know, margin of error on these things? Like, I know the polls have been really bad lately. We know about Brexit and Trump and all of that. Um, there were a lot of things, and it was just incredible to actually be part of that. I think as a 38-year-old American, I do not remember being part of a sort of unequivocal victory like that in this country. It's always politicians who inevitably disappoint you. Um, so some of the lessons that I really think are important here, um, some of it is just that like it doesn't map onto US politics. This split parties. The right wing is in charge in the Republic of Ireland right now. Leo Vardcar, don't be shocked by his like charming socks and the fact that he's gay and the son of immigrants. He is a right wing Thatcherite who is letting refugees and asylum seekers starve. Um, and he's probably going to try to use this to cruise to re-election. Um, but his party backed the referendum. Um, Fianna Fáil, which is Eamon de Valera's party, was the most conservative party. Um, the leader of Fianna Fáil, in fact, backed the referendum. It was the one that I think in exit polling, um, most of the people who voted no were Fianna Fáil voters. Um, and about 50% of their members of parliament were opposed to it. Um, Sinn Féin, Becca already covered, um, was in favor of repeal, but not really in favor of a pro-choice position, although one of the people on this bus with me out to Roscommon was a member of the European Parliament from Sinn Féin, who was a very, very vocal pro-choice campaigner. So here's hoping that they win in uh, the gathering this weekend. Um, the smaller parties, um, the Labour Party has been sort of trying to ride this for a long time, and the Irish Labour Party is terrible. Um, and um, yeah, and then there were smaller parties like People Before Profit and a lot of independent members of the parliament who are um, very left in various ways and are not members of a party. This is a thing that we don't really have again in the US other than Bernie Sanders. So picture like a whole bunch of little young feminist Bernie Sanderses. Um, so the big names and the big parties sort of theoretically endorsed the campaign, but it was won by the people on the ground and it was won by feminists who have been fighting since the Eighth Amendment went in and who have been doing work in women's clinics and making sure that people can get illegal abortion pills or can get to England if they need to, who are connecting them with these networks. Um, it was won by people who worked on the marriage referendum. Um, it was won by people from the North and it was won by people who, if you looked at the home to vote hashtag, it would make you cry. All the people who flew home to vote for this. and. Um, to go back to the, the question of personal stories, this is really where I want to end because like, the pro-choice movement in the US is often very afraid of saying what it's for. And this has been a thing that has made me very angry for a long time. Um, we hear about women's health and women's health is very important. But they don't mean like women's health, they're not like campaigning for single payer healthcare, they mean abortion when they say women's health. Um, and they won't say abortion. And we are told that we can't talk about it. And I just watched an entire country have a national referendum talking about it. And like even in conservative parts of the country, most of the people you knocked on their door would talk to you. And they maybe even knew somebody. You had people who I met who had had an abortion, who had never told anybody until this campaign, and then it was such a relief to them to meet people who wouldn't judge them for it and who would hear their story and listen to them and work with them and support them. And like, you know, this woman cried while she was telling me about going to England for her abortion and how it changed her parents' experience. Um, this is, you know, 170,000 Irish women have had abortions abroad since the Eighth Amendment. And that's, it's not a very big country. What's the population of, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, we're talking about 
a lot of people who potentially know somebody and only found out that they knew somebody because of this campaign. Um, one of my favorite stories was somebody on the bus said she had met a mother and daughter who had both had abortions and who had never told each other until this campaign. And then they both sort of sat down to be like, I have to tell you. And it turned out, of course, that they had both done it. Um, and so I think the, the lesson for the US right now is, I mean, there's several of them, but one of them is that we have to actually tell, convince people that you can't be afraid of saying what we're for. This free abortion on demand shirts are excellent, by the way. Um, <laughs> that people can and will talk about the things that are divisive and scary and controversial and personal. Um, that we can actually talk about that. And when people actually hear you talk about it as something, not as like an abstract moral issue, again, but as something that happened to you, something that might happen to you, something that happened to someone you know, something that happened to somebody who had killed, then you take this issue out of sort of abstract whatever territory and you bring it back down to like, do you think I have fundamental human rights or don't you? Um, you know, Savita Halapanavar's face was on posters all over Ireland. Um, and there were um, some of the folks that I met in Roscommon were talking about um, the uh, Iona Institute, the Catholic, some, some, I don't know exactly, something related to the Catholic Church, had put up a big billboard of sort of a demonic looking fetus. A lot of these things looked really scary. I don't know why, like I was like, if that was inside me, I would definitely get rid of it. <laughs> My sense of humor, though, didn't like go over great. I must say, on this campaign, people were kind of like, "Okay, you're a little much." Um, but like, so they had this billboard of this kind of demonic-looking, evil fetus, and it's like he's one of us. Was it Ian Paisley? I mean, it might be Ian Paisley <laughs> as a fetus. Um, and so the the activists got together and they took a picture around it, and it was a bunch of women, and they said had signs that said, "What's missing in this picture? One of us." Mm -hmm. Because like a lot of the rhetoric was really disembodied. You see all these signs of these you know floating disembodied fetuses that are actually like a 12 month old baby. Um, you know, my, my friend Ronan was joking that um, next thing you know they're gonna have like a school uniform on it and inside of somebody. Um, and what's not in most of those posters and not in most of those signs is the actual person who is pregnant. Um, and so to see this face of this very specific woman whose story yeah. everyone in Ireland knows, um, her family made videos, you know, to really say like, this is actually about real humans. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, I, I count like a few cars that, you know, drove by and said, you should be embarrassed. There were definitely people who, you know, stalked around the neighborhood and whatever, but I was also just impressed by how many people would actually mm -hmm have a conversation and who would think about it and talk to you about it. And, you know, I don't, we don't, we can't map the Irish political system onto ours tomorrow, unfortunately for many reasons, fortunately for others. But what we can do is like stop being scared of it. I don't know, I'm just, I'm so frustrated by a lot of the stuff in this country a lot of the time. And, you know, again, the fact that you saw these poll numbers and the poll numbers were tightening the week before, and then it goes completely in the other direction and it's 67%. It was, it was just 57% in conservative, conservative parts of Ireland. Um, this is a winning issue. If we called a referendum on it tomorrow in the US, we'd win. All right, thank you all so much. Um, so now I wanted for, to us, for, for us to have time um, to have questions and comments from people in the audience. I know that there are people in the audience who um, were in Ireland or who are Irish or who have been following this issue closely. So um, you know, if you wanna make a comment, feel free to do that. But then also if you have questions, you know, we have a lot of expertise here. But over here, um, and so um, also, if folks have questions, um, we should throw those out as well. Um, and I think the live stream is so. I think what we'll do is take all questions for Becca first. Oh, okay. So yeah, she is right. hearing us over the Facebook Live, but there's like a 20 second delay. 
So uh, all questions for her maybe, and then she can answer them all at once. And then we can okay. go back to the panelists. Um, thanks to the panelists, this was an incredible panel. I have so many questions. I'm just gonna get to it. Uh, first, um, did people make a connection when the referendum won for same-sex marriage and say, okay, this is a sign that the, the hold of the Catholic Church is really breaking, and was that, uh, well, was that the impetus for the referendum uh, to repeal the eighth? I'm just thinking about the US, you know, we, we, we won, and we had a mass movement for same-sex marriage, we won full federal equality, and, and we're, we've been just been losing um, around abortion rights. It's just a disconnect, and I'm wondering if there was a con an explicit connection made by uh, Irish activists. The second one was, um, what was the what was the the reasoning from the right wing um, parties for supporting this? Is it, it was is it more like a we don't want Irish people to migrate out because we have a crisis of. Uh, uh, Irish, uh, young uh, Irish folks migrating outwards for, or what was the reasoning for that? Um, was it about kind of demographics? Um, and um, uh, for Becca, uh, I know people before Profit really did a lot of the groundwork around canvassing. Are they feeling like they're gaining members and momentum now in Northern Ireland, like actual grassroots activists joining the party as a result of that? And there's been a number of uh, organizing around austerity and the uh, water crisis and privatization. Um, do do people feel like and you know do people feel like this is going to be a kind of a key uh, key movement um, for Protestant uh, Catholic unity against uh, sectarianism uh, in the north? Uh, what do those dynamics look like? I'm I'm pretty ignorant about uh, those politics. Uh, and the other part was how much of the, the movement uh, that was led by the trade unions, how, uh, how much of that really kind of helped push this within the working class as a central question of solidarity um, uh, 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 um, against oppression? Thanks. Um, I had a question. I know that with repealing the eighth that um, women can get an abortion, I think it's up to 12 or 15 weeks, I think, though I could be wrong on like the actual number of weeks. I wanted to, see, I wanted to know, is, has there been any talk of pushing that into the third trimester? Um, I mean, I know it's super early, and maybe this question shouldn't be asked like until like a couple months from now, but I was just trying to see if there had been any talk of that, and then finally, you had mentioned, I think, early on that there had been Americans that had gone down to Ireland in the last like week or two on the far right, and that it caused a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. Do we know specifically who Americans like those were? <laughs> well. Do either of you want to um, make any comments about those questions, or we could take some more? Um. Um. I'm sure you have thoughts. <laughs> um, no, I just, I suppose, speaking to the issue of the, whether the gay marriage referendum um, was kind of a driving force, um, I think that it, yeah, it certainly provided, you know, kind of a huge momentum. It was, the, it was, for Ireland, it was really the kind of decisive break, really, the first really decisive break that we, you know, um, I'm not from the Republic, but the, the Republic had, taken to basically towards the separation of church and state, um, you know, um, and I think that that's why it was so important. Um, that's why it was such a kind of dramatic win um, because it was the first kind of, you know, I mean, it, when you look at Again, I, I think it's, as uh, kind of we've mentioned, it's just, you know, the role of the Catholic Church um, as a sort of, as governing every aspect, really, of, of, uh, of people's lives, of healthcare, of education, of, of the rest of it, but, and, you know, um, and of 
sort of governing um, women's lives, governing women's bodies. You know, divorce wasn't legal, I think, until 1996. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, contraception, you know, the church stood for so long against contraception. I think it was like in the 19, the mid 1980s that contraception um, was, was legalized and that was kind of very hard fought battle. Um, but I think that you know the ultimately the the issue of abortion really had its own momentum, its own impetus, and it um, because you know the the because of you know what women have had to go through, um, you know three thousand women a year going to England to have abortions, and that's just you know those that can afford it. Um, I think it costs something on average around a thousand euros. Um, to, to do that, you know, that's that's not everyone that can afford that. People don't have, you know, access to even, you know, a lot of information about how to do that. Um, but I think, yeah, I think that the those two issues, the, the kind of marriage equality and abortion are very much, yeah, I think they're very much related in terms of, um, you know, us, us kind of really trying to cast off the, the shackles of this incredibly archaic institution, which I think too has been very delegitimized by you know all these recent scandals to do with you know pedophile priests and you know all of it, especially the things that have come out with the mother and baby homes, you know, hundreds of you know in total thousands of, I mean it's barbaric of of, of dead bodies, mass graves, being, mass graves. Um, you know I think a lot of that has really you know successfully delegitimize the church, especially to younger people. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that abortion really, in its own right, um, has, has been, you know, an incredibly, uh, for good reason, an incredibly contentious and incredibly powerful, powerful issue, so. Do we have Becca back? Do we have Becca? Right. I'll just say two things and then you can get rid of me and we can end, <laughs> end the nightmare of Skype. Um, so hopefully this will work. Um, so just to say a few things, um, I agree with um, Roisin around that there was a, there, the own momentum around um, abortion rights for sure and around choice. But I think it's also important that the equal marriage referendum made people feel like we could actually win this. And it was this momentum that came after that that said, okay, repeal is next. Um, and people were chanting that um, during the equal marriage referendum. And I think in exit polls uh, or polls right before um, the, the vote, something like 98% of the LGBT community voted yes. Um, and so, 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 so they were so. going to vote yes. And so I do think there was a lot of solidarity between them as well as a fair amount of activists who were very much part of the um, Yes Equality campaign and were also part of the, the campaign for abortion reform. And just to say, so why did the right wing support it? Well, I think the right wing was dragged kicking and screaming, and that's the same thing in the North. And so what had actually happened is that um, there's been this basically a a discussion about there being reform on uh, on abortion for the past you know, since 2012, since 2012, um, and since Savita died, there was sort of this, this sense of, well, we're going to actually legislate on it, but it was going to take more and more time um, to do so. And so I think that it was sort of only a matter of time. And so they created the Citizens Assembly, which I believe someone talked about. Um, but I do think that the government thought the Citizens Assembly would be really... Um, would be pretty tame and would say something like, oh, there should be only abortion in certain certain um, situations. And so they were wrong. The Simpsons Assembly was much further um, to the left, much more pro-choice than they anticipated. And so the politicians had to keep catching up to what people were beginning to say themselves. And what they were saying themselves was that if you listen to women, you can't have legislation that just covers them all. And I think that that's where the 12 week um, legislation. Now there's no legislation in yet, so this is just what the government is gonna put forward. It's their white paper, which will probably pass, um, and that's for abortion upon request for 12 weeks. 
And then after that, in the case of um, only in cases of um, uh, fatal fetal abnormality or in serious risk to the woman's um, health or life. And so I think that that's important because that's the only reason that you ever have abortions are because of some something is wrong with the fetus or something is wrong with um, with the with the woman in terms of her health um, carrying the fetus because if you are in an unwanted pregnancy and abortion is available then you generally have it within um, as soon as possible so I just think that 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 is the main um, reason why that is something that to, to, to support um, and then just to say in terms of, terms of people before profit, I mean, people before profit's growing. We, I think, did an extreme, like, you know, if we're talking about how we did as a political party, I think we did extremely well in the campaign. We led tons of canvassing teams, and I think um, it, we, along with Solidarity and um, the Green Party, are really the pro-choice parties. Um, and we're really um, unapologetic about it. Of course, as um, Sarah said, there's also um, a, a bunch of independents as well. And so I think that this is, a, you know, we, we will grow out of this. I think, I mean, it's two weeks after the referendum and we've been all, all hands on deck for trying to push forward um, re uh, reform in the North as well as uh, more organizing. So we'll sort of see in terms of what this means for elections. Um, but I think that we're seeing more and more political parties catching up to a more and more pro-choice position, which might um, which might satisfy their supporters who are pro-choice, or their supporters might say, well, you didn't do enough, and so um, they might begin to look for other political parties, such as People for Profit or the other parties that have been unapologetically pro-choice for a long time. So we'll see on how that goes, um, and just to say thank you very much for having me and sorry about the technical difficulties and um, it was lovely to hear Rashin and um, Sarah in your presentations. Thanks, Becca. Yeah, I just wanted to, yeah. the, the right-wing party question, like I can't stress enough how little Irish political parties map onto American ones. You cannot understand them in terms of Democrats and Republicans. Um, they don't split on social issues that way. Um, and so Fine Gael is the current governing party. Leo Varadkar is, as I said, he's gay. He is the son of an immigrant. I remember having to explain to friends here who are very excited about Ireland's gay prime minister that no, he's a right-wing lunatic. Um, <laughs> But what he is, is a very smart neoliberal politician who wants to make Ireland look good for investors. And gay marriage and all of these things look very good when you are a country that most of its economy is still built on being a tax haven for the global corporations. Um, and so this is, you know, it's useful for him to look like the good guy right now. Um, and it will continue to, you know, rebound badly for a lot of people, including a lot of people who actually in practice need abortions. Um, and, you know, when you have something like Sinn Féin, which is a party that goes back to the struggle for Irish independence, um, a big part of that has always been a very Catholic, identitarian, nationalist position. And there's always been, and there is especially now that Sinn Féin has made a comeback in the Republic as an anti-austerity party, a very big tension between the sort of left wing of Sinn Féin and this, you know, this more traditionalist Catholic tendency. And so it's, it's hard to say like left, right in these ways um, in that same way. Fianna Fáil is the sort of easiest one to say like this is a socially conservative party that didn't do a you know, and even they were sort of yanked, kicking and screaming to finally say like the law we have is actually killing people and perhaps we should change it. Um, and then the right wing Americans, our favorite subject. <laughs> um, and they are the usual suspects, right? There was a great story in BuzzFeed UK about, um, actually it might've been BuzzFeed over here, about um, the app that was made for two of the supposedly independent vote no campaigns. There was one called Love Both, which my friends hilariously called the Love Boaters, um, because of course people are taking the boat if you don't have abortion in Ireland. And um, the Save the Eighth campaign had nearly identical apps made by the same company that had also made apps for the Brexit campaign, Trump, the NRA, 
um, and various other, you know, international right wing whatevers. And so, um, just a thing that I think is really interesting to think about is the way this sort of pronatalist anti-abortion, we must birth a lot of white babies tendency is really there under a lot of the right wing nationalism that's growing around the country, around the world rather. Um, and Ireland doesn't have as big a tendency on that front as a lot of countries that got whacked by austerity, but it is still there and that you can, you know, if you see the other people who are making these apps and these uh, things, then you will find that trajectory. Do we have other questions? Yeah, a couple in the front. I think Anne's coming with the mic, cool. Okay, I have um, two. Um, one, I don't know if you guys know about like the, you said you were at some clinics, women's clinics. Um, By women, at women's clinics, but. Like, do you know if the, what the capacity is for, like do they have doctors that are trained in abortion? Um, and if, no, it's okay, <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I was, just, I was just curious if, like, people were trying to get trained or, like, what that's looking like. Um, and then also um, I had a question about the stories piece. So I think it's really interesting and um, powerful um, what you were talking about, that women are sharing their stories. Um, but I've noticed, like, in the U.S., like, we, we use certain stories, um, at, like, or we, meaning like the mainstream pro-choice yeah. movement, um, yeah. we often that like vic like stories of victimhood, um, younger women, yeah. uh, fetal anomaly, um, and I was wondering if it was the same uh, sort of narrative that was used. I was actually going to talk a little bit about that when I when I um, raised my hand. I was actually in Ireland the last couple of weeks before the referendum, and one of the things that, that I noticed was exactly that, that there was an actual debate inside of the Irish um, Yes Movement, the, mm -hmm. the Together for Yes Movement, which was kind of the mainstream coalition around, uh, around the, um, uh, repealing the Eighth, about hard case, the whole issue of hard cases, mm -hmm. which is what they call the extreme stories, the ones that the mainstream abortion rights movement relies on here. And, you know, it was sort of like the hard cases are what are going to kind of convince people. That's what we have to talk about. That's what we have to talk about. But I think Sarah was also referring to something really different, which is that in addition to what some people felt was an over-focus on the hard cases, Absolutely. Um, there was also people just sharing that they'd had abortions. It was yeah. like the shout out your abortion right. movement in yeah. this country. Um, you know, it, and that I think was really important because w one of the things that I was thinking toward the, the last last few days was that when it looked like it was gonna be very, very, very close, and yet the um, uh, marriage equality vote had been so big, was like, the reason that the marriage equality vote was so big in Ireland, I think, was because so many people, regardless of their religious or their ideological background, had a gay loved one, that people had finally, over the years, come out and so, in, in, the, in, in the case of my friends who, who'd gotten married, um, you know, their big conservative Catholic families all came to the wedding, all had a loving response to it, and, and, and so on, because they knew these guys and they loved them, you know? And that was kind of what was missing in some ways in the abortion thing, and what, what scared me about it was because not everybody knows a hard case. You know, but everybody really does know someone that's had an abortion. Yeah. They just don't know it, you know, and that kind of thing. So there, but there was really a good effort to bring those stories out, which, yeah. I, which I think was, was really important. The other thing, and, and um, maybe Sarah, you could, could say if you notice this too. One of the things that I noticed was how, you know, kind of careful and how far to the right in some ways, I don't mean the right, like the right wing, but, you know, how... Um, far to the center, I guess is more to say, a lot of the public debate was, and I talked to women, and but mainly women in the trade union movement where I was working, but also outside of it, that you know there was, a, there was actually quite a big debate about whether or not um, we should talk about choice. Choice was seen as a radical word. Yeah. We, we in, in, the, in New York City for abortion rights think of choice as kind of a conservative position that's why we say free abortion on demand. But, but people in the mainstream uh, movement in, in Ireland were saying choice just sounds too much like 
oh, she can just do it for choice, not because she desperately needs to, yeah. you know, that, that kind of debate yeah. went on. So it, all of those, the same discussions that we have went on there, and I think all, a few steps to this, toward the center from, mm -hmm. from, from where we are now. And I'm going to shut up. I just, the last thing I just want to say is that when you know, people are talking about um, abortion without apologies, that's really why New York City for Abortion Rights was formed. And what we stand for is open discussion about abortion, about fighting for abortion specifically, not just choice, reproductive justice all the way around, but specifically speaking out about abortion. And so if you, um, uh, you know, think that that's the right approach and that's the way to build a, a new movement for abortion rights, we hope that you'll join us. And we have t-shirts for sale. <laughs> and they're great t-shirts. Model in the shirt. Do we have any more? Before we... Hi, thank you all so much. That was amazing. Um, I have a question for you, Sarah. So um, last year in 2017, yeah. I was involved with a bus that went around Ireland and connected people with the yeah. abortion pill. Yeah, And that amazing. had been the third year of mm -hmm. a similar action. The first bus had gone out two yeah. years before, and then there was a uh, pill drop mm -hmm. over the northern border yeah. the year prior. But so we were on the bus, and something that I kept hearing a lot of was people coming up and saying, oh, I guess, so this is, this is happening. Abortion yeah. is happening here. It's happening mm -hmm. in your bathroom and your bedroom, and it's in the country. So yeah. I, guess, yeah. I guess we need to think about that and talk about that. I think Leo Varadkar had some quote or Simon Harris or something about yeah. how the next Anne Lovett would be a 14-year-old who took pills in her bedroom with no help. Yeah. Um, and so I started hearing that, and I was talking to Women on Web, who was our main correspondent, mm -hmm. helping connect us with those pills, and asked them if they would ever do it in America. And so I'm asking this as someone who's, I'm not American, I'm from yeah. Canada. Yeah. Um, and the, the answer from Women on Web, and then also in a later discussion with Women Help Women, it's very much they work in places where abortion is not legal totally. Yeah. But then there also seemed to be this kind of like specter of fear that America is a very dangerous place to be having these actions in. But kind of the flip side is that this action changed a lot of minds. Mm -hmm. This action, I mean, yeah. tangibly connected so many women with yeah. life-saving life -saving medication and also brought this kind of reality into light that changed minds. Do you think something like that would be possible here, lucrative here, or just totally out of the question? I mean, right after Trump's election, I, friends and I were sitting around like, how do we get a drone? And we can fly the pills in with a drone. Um, because the thing that's going to happen in the US if they ever get around to repealing Roe, which they want to do, is that it will be state by state. So in New York, we'll be fine, right? We'll be fine. Um, but we will be, and we already are a place where people come to have later term abortions that they can't access elsewhere. And there already are networks where people come into New York City and stay with people in New York City to access an abortion that they can't get where they are. Um, and so it will be that kind of a question and it will be like, okay, can we bring pills into you know, Indiana from here? Um, I absolutely think that that's a thing that we should be thinking about and be very aware of. Um, I also think that weirdly the sort of it already happens here argument also like the no campaign was sort of secretly banking on in Ireland mm -hmm. um, in a way that was very interesting that like we talked to when I was out with Becca canvassing um, a young woman who was standing at the door with her small child and was saying well you know they can just go to England if it's that bad. And so we were like sort of terrified that this kind of existing safety valve would actually allow people to like vote no and be like, oh, but the people who really need one, they can get one anyway, because they are already happening. The constitution already says you have a right to travel. Mm -hmm. um, the government can't stop you from traveling. And so, you know, it was, that was the sort of frightening thing that we were also kind of wondering if like the no campaign is using that argument is basically saying, well, they can go to England, but one of the things that was so fascinating to me, back to this sort of thing of nation and, and whatever that I'm obsessed with, was how many of the posters from the no side were based in Irish identity. That there were posters with the 1916 rising leaders, they didn't have James Connolly on them because they weren't that stupid, but I did speak <laughs> to the great grandniece of Joseph Plunkett who was on these posters. And they said, they said, cherish all the children of Ireland equally, vote no. 
And this woman was pissed because she was like, he was a socialist and he was a feminist and he would have been on our side and we are the ones bringing about the republic that he fought for, not the no campaign. But there were also all these ones about like, in England, one in five babies is aborted. Yeah. Don't bring this to Ireland. Uh-huh. And the way that like, that kind of identity was an interesting thing. And then people on the other side would flip it around and say like, our Irish women are having abortions. They're just having them in England. Why can't they have them safe and legally at home? Um, and the, but yeah, the sort of, the question of whether accessibility of pills and accessibility of England, at least sort of, um, swayed people one way or the other. I guess we didn't know how it was gonna go until the day of, and I think it d- pretty decisively went for people just saying, well, they're already doing it, so we can't pretend that we like morally oppose it because we already know that they have the safety valve to do it. So in um, <clears throat> Savita's case, it seemed like physicians were kind of playing this game of, not a game, but like brinksmanship with this woman's health. Mm-hmm. And they, they were really, they couldn't perform the abortion because they still detected a fetal heartbeat. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if like in the, um, the repeal campaign, if there was like discussion about how the definition of health is incredibly subjective mm-hmm. and it's not something that the state could determine and even at like the level of like the clinicians that there are different yeah um, I mean I guess uh, assessments of risk or yeah, yeah. I don't know if you want to um, I'm not quite sure I understand your question um, that it's how the health as an issue overall has been treated uh, in relation to abortion in the repeal campaign, or? Yeah, I think what I'm saying is that, I mean, there have been like so many like attempts to sort of split the definition of health, like, right? Okay, abortion's allowed in the case of, of suicide, but mm-hmm. abortion's allowed, you know, only when we can't detect a fetal heartbeat. You know, I like, um, I th- yeah, I think, I mean, what, because when you had the various attempts to introduce legislation over the years, over the decades, I think what, each time um, a new amendment would be, would be sort of uh, repealed or introduced, um, it, it would just always had its limitations. I mean, you know, after the, the X case, um, it was deemed that, you know, um, that, that, that women could travel abroad for abortions that you know that i think the and that it was deemed that um it, that it would be um in the in this kind of life saving capacity that it could be performed but i mean in each case there was something then that that would have happened another case that sort of exposed the limitations of just how that did not work ultimately um yeah i think like that's my point is yeah. that oftentimes you know that there are so many near miss cases. You know, here, like, the, you know, the Department of Health in New York City recently commissioned a report on, um, like, yeah, near miss um, maternal deaths. You know, women who had in severe pregnancy complications and just came to the point where, you know, it was almost too late for them. But yeah, and I think another issue too, and it, um, it goes back to the fact that you know what, what Savita exposed was the whole kind of healthcare system in Ireland is that you know a lot of people, doctors. I think it's, I think it's optional, um, uh, at least that you know it's kind of an elective um, sort of um, aspect of the medical training that they that they don't know how to actually perform abortions um, to, you know, even in these life-saving cases. So if you have somebody that's rushed into hospital, you can't save their life because you don't know how. So I think, you know, and then, you know, and I think one of the biggest kind of challenges going forward, again, is looking at the, you know, as a structural issue to do with the Catholic Church, is just how really this, 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 um, new legislation is going to be, you know, the repeal is going to be implemented um, because Catholic churches are, I mean, sorry, the Catholic ch- uh, church um, 
essentially uh, runs um, most hospitals. And so I think there's kind of going to be a real fight to do with, you know, doctors um, kind of using this conscience clause mm -hmm. Uh, to say that they don't want to take part in this. I think that's actually going to be a, a real kind of struggle going forward. Um, you know, so I, I, I think that it's going to, you know, it's going to take um, the, the campaign. I mean, it's really, we're so far from over. We're kind of just beginning at this point. So it's going to really kind of take, you know, continued pressure to sort of expedite this legislation coming into effect and to really create a whole system of, of a, a health care that has not previ previously existed in Ireland. Um, so, I mean, it's actually kind of a huge undertaking, um, and that's why we have to keep going, so. And you, I forgot you had asked the question of, of the sort of women's clinics, and like, even giving information about abortion was illegal until the 93 referendums exactly. as well. Yeah. So um, you should say that, I should have said that before. Um, and so you have these women's clinics that are there that are, you know, are part of a feminist network of women's clinics the same way we would have such a thing, you know, a history of that here. But they were like legally prohibited from like giving out contraception until that became legal. Yeah. Um, from giving out even like the sort of like, you could go to England, like you could go to jail for that. Um, and so that kind of, you know, building out on that network. But the other reason I think, going back to the 12 weeks question that um, the government has sort of said, like the Avard Cars government has kind of said that they want, they envision treatment being based around pills. And the pills are basically recommended for up to 12 weeks. So that mm -hmm. is sort of one way that they think they can get off the ground sooner. And also um, I think that they just generally find the pills less achy possibly because people have been using them for a while. But, um, but they require less training and less, um, you know, whatever than like medical, um, surgical abortion. So yeah, but it's gonna be very, very interesting. And I think also just the overwhelming nature of this vote is gonna make some of this a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Whereas like people that I was talking to in like the days leading up were sort of preparing for like the right wing parties challenging it if it was really close and claiming that like ballots had been stolen and like, they vote on paper ballots, and it's counted sort of the day after. So I'm used to sort of American things. I was like, what do you mean we're not going to know on Friday night? You mean I'm going to be flying out, and I'm still not going to know what's happened? And like I knew what had happened by that time because, again, it was so overwhelming. But a friend of mine was a legal observer in there, and you know, you have to like fight with the legal observers from the other side about whether this is a real ballot sometimes. Um, and luckily, this was big enough that it didn't come down to things like spoiled ballots, but like it sure could have. Um, and that was, you know, it was a very real fear that, you know, if it was close, they would just delay and delay and delay and delay. And so the overwhelming nature of it makes it a lot harder for people to claim that, like, there's a real constituency that doesn't want this to happen and it wasn't representative. Yeah. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. I'll go back. Great. We can have another meeting. You can come back and tell us about it. <laughs> um, Okay, great. Well, um, if there aren't any other questions, I just want to, um, oh, is there another question? Oh, yep. Hello. Hey. So this is kind of a two-part question-ish. So uh, would it be useful in activism around abortion rights in the U.S.? as including it as part of a, a larger package for healthcare for all? Because from what I understand in Ireland, uh, you guys have publicly funded healthcare, but I would imagine that before the eighth was repealed, that, that, not, that didn't include the provision of abortion services. And so was there a connection made in the movement for repeal in equating uh, universal healthcare with reproductive care and how it necessitates the inclusion of abortion services and how that, can that be leveraged further in like other movements? <laughs> I'm from the north. I actually don't know that much about the Irish healthcare system, um, except that our healthcare system in the north is more publicly funded than it yeah. is in the south. It's much yeah. more privatized in the south, actually. Yeah. Um, y you know, I know under the, the NHS, the, you know, in the north, I mean, at least in the UK, uh, the rest of the Britain, then, you know, that, that, that actually it seems to be fairly 
well funded um, compared to this country. Um, uh, but um, I, 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 I don't know enough about the Irish healthcare system to comment on that. I'm sorry, in the Republic. Um, yeah, it's not a fully universal healthcare system the way yeah. that, and that is also related to the Catholic Church. Um, but there was definitely, especially from, again, the smaller left parties, um, like People Before Profit, like the Workers' Party, things like that, a very explicit, like, we need this, you know, there were definitely free, safe, and legal buttons that I saw. People are definitely connecting this to mm -hmm. the need for an actual, real public healthcare system. Um, and I absolutely, like, it's tough, right, when we're talking about the questions of, of how to talk about these things. Um, saying women's health is really important, our health is important, um, but also we do have to be specific and say, like, abortion should be part of this. It is, there is no excuse for it not being part of this. Um, you know, Hyde Amendment fights in this country, things like that. Um, you know, we really need people to actually be willing to say, like, abortion is part of healthcare. It is a very specific part of healthcare. We need to make sure that it is fully included and funded and supported and not stigmatized um, up to and whenever people may need it. Mm -hmm. And that kind of fight, like, I think was explicitly coming from Ireland's left, which is fragmented and complicated, but also, you know, in some ways more institutionally powerful than the one we have here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would also just say that, um, I mean, the dynamic about people having to travel and pay thousands of dollars, I mean, in this case, in Ireland, it's to England, but we have that dynamic very much in the US as well, yeah. um, where people are forced to travel to other states um, and pay thousands of dollars. Um, and in some instances not be able to access care because they can't afford it, right? Because right. we don't have free, safe, um, legal abortion here either. Um, and this is something that NYC for Abortion Rights, the group that put on this meeting, um, organizes around. We are a group that um, is not afraid to talk about abortion um, and we engage in clinic defense and we also try to make um, ideological arguments that um, it, people on the left should talk about abortion and that it's something that we should be fighting for. Um, so if you're interested in joining us, if you don't know us, please come talk to me or Kate, who has the sign-up sheet um, over by where the great t-shirts are for sale. Um, and then I think Laura is going to tell us about a another cool event that we have coming up.